Uh, let's carry on here. And uh, we're looking at this sutta on the seven kinds of perceptions that lead to uh, the deathless or the freedom from death, the Gutya Sanya Sutta, second sutta on perceptions. Uh, and uh, so the first one is the perception on ugliness or the lack of beauty, the Asuba Sanya. So what does it mean that this leads to the deathless? Let's have a quick look at this. It's not too profound, so we just probably go through it reasonably fast. Let's see what happens with this one. So, so uh, when a mendicant often meditates with a mind reinforced with the perception of asuba, huh? the mind draws back from sexual intercourse. They shrink away, turn aside, and don't get drawn into it. And either equanimity or revulsion uh, become stabilized. Uh, so this is what we're discussing before, the purpose of the uh, uh, contemplating the 31 parts of the body. We saw before that this is about the 31 parts of the body uh, and seeing the body in this way. Uh, and uh, the idea is basically to lose some of the attraction of the body. And that's kind of what this is about. You can see it here. Uh, and then the mind is stabilized. Either you have equanimity or you have a revulsion. Uh, revulsion here, what is the... Word for revulsion, that's a good question. Huh? Nibida, maybe? Huh? Let's have a quick look, see what the uh, word for revulsion is. Huh? Er. Uh, patikula, patikulata. Okay, so this is like revulsion or, uh, um, yeah. So, yeah. So I think that's fair enough, revulsion. Uh, or disgust is another word. <laughs> so it's quite quite strong word. So either equanimity or disgust become stabilized. Uh, so that gives you a very clear idea what the purpose of these perceptions are. Yeah. So give up the opposite quality. Basically the attraction to the body. That's basically what it is about. Uh, and uh, then uh, it says, it's like a chicken, chicken's feather or a strip of sinew thrown in a fire. Uh, it shrivels up, shrinks, rolls up, and doesn't stretch out. Uh, yeah, the idea, like when you throw something like a feather or something towards a fire, it kind of turns back in a sense. It turns away from the fire. It shrivels up and turns back, rolls back in a sense. Uh, and this is like the mind. The mind just uh, turns away from something here. Uh, same kind of idea. In the same way, uh, when a mendicant off meditates with a mind reinforced so with a perception of uh, ugliness, the mind draws back from sexual intercourse. So if a mendicant off meditates with a mind reinforced with a perception of ugliness, uh, but the mind is not, but their mind is drawn to sexual intercourse and not repulsed, they should know my perception of ugliness is undeveloped. I don't have any distinction higher than before. Uh, I haven't attained the fruit of development. Uh, and this may, in this way, they are aware of the situation. Uh, so, uh, so this is a very kind of high degree of um, development of the mind. Yeah, It is where you lose all your interest uh, in the kind of the ordinary uh, uh, pleasures of the world. Uh, uh, so you kind of, the mind recoils from anything to do with sexuality. Huh? And uh, that's just very, it's a very strong one. So if there's if it's any remnant of that desire left, uh, you haven't really developed your mind fully in this way. Huh? The mind should really uh, be equanimous about these things. Huh? And that is called then a distinction, a visesa, when you get there. Huh? It's like you have overcome completely an opposing factor. And because you overcome something completely, it's a distinction of the mind. Uh, this is like the full development of something. Uh, that is a fruit of that uh, development. Uh, but these kind of things you have to be um, careful with. I wouldn't normally recommend these things unless you are a monastic and unless your meditation is going really well. I would recommend this sort of thing. Uh, and the reason is because the mind needs, you know, we need to find happiness in life. Uh, and we need to find happiness somewhere. And if you find happiness in meditation or the spiritual path, then great. Then you can overcome all of these other things and you can let them go. Uh, 
but uh, it's important not to live a life that is devoid of all sorts of joy and happiness. If you try that, uh, you're going to fail and you're going to have a miserable life on top of it. Uh, so don't recommend the miserable life. Uh, if you look at people like Ajahn Brahm, it's not misery is not the path. Yeah. <laughs> This is kind of the, one of the things I like about Ajahn Brahm. He's like a, a salesman of happiness. So. <laughs> and uh, so that is what he, what he does. And, and uh, this is exactly the same thing we have here. And uh, you have this last little phrase here, the idea that uh, in this way they are aware of the situation. The Pali word is simply that they are sampajana. Yeah, we talked a little bit before about sati sampajanya, mindfulness and uh, full awareness of mindfulness and situational awareness. And uh, so here is quite clear what that means. It means you understand what is going on. It's not that you are aware at all moments, but you have an all overall idea of what is happening. You know that you haven't really undertaken the full development in this regard. So, um, yeah. So I wouldn't be too concerned about this. I would just note it for now that this is one of the possibilities of meditation. So you are aware or what is possible to do. And then it goes on with the same thing again. This, this is very repetitive, this sutta. So, but if a man they can often meditate with the mind, reinforcement, the perception of ugliness, their mind draws back from sexual intercourse. They should know my perception of ugliness is well developed. I have realized a distinction higher than before. I have attained a fruit of development. In this way, they have sampadanya. And they are aware of the situation. The reason why he so aware of the situation is sampajano. Yeah, situational awareness is uh, Bhattasujata's translation of uh, sampajana, sampajanya, sampajano. It's an unusual translation, but it is uh, acceptable, I reckon. So, okay, let's move on. Ah, it's more still. When the perception of ugliness is developed and cultivated, it is very fruitful and beneficial. It culminates in the freedom from death and ends with the freedom from death. Uh, that's what I said, and this is why I said it. Uh, when the perception of death is developed and cultivated, uh, it is very fruitful and beneficial. Uh, it culminates in the deathless and ends with the deathless. Uh, that's what I said. But why did I say it? Yeah, so again, it's interesting. Perception of death, yeah, it comes back to being one of the core perceptions on the Buddhist path. And it's a very simple perception. And it's something that the Buddha specifically says everyone should do. And here it is also part of this idea of something that takes you all the way to the end of the path. Yeah, freedom from death, the very end of things. So this gives an idea of how foundation of it is. And going back to the sutta we had looked at before, the Arya Pariyasana Sutta, uh, where the Buddha to be thinks about death yeah, before his awakening. Yeah. And this is what makes him a monastic. Yeah. And in the end, that very perception of the danger of death is actually what makes awakening possible. Yeah, That is the foundation for awakening itself. That's kind of extraordinary. Yeah. We have Buddhism today because there was one person in history who really contemplated death really profoundly. It shows you the potential for this kind of contemplation. It's actually far more profound than it may seem uh, initially. So let's see what the Buddha has to say about this very briefly here. When a mendicant often meditates with a mind reinforced with the perception of death, they may, their mind draws back from the desire to be reborn. That is what I, that, that's what I said, and this is why I said it. So it goes through the same long section as before, and here it's very contracted just to get the main essence of what is being said. Yeah, so if you have a very strong perception of death, the um, withdrawal from the desire to be reborn, the desire to be reborn here is the, uh, what is it again, jivita, Jivita Nikanta, something like that. Yeah, the mind doesn't is not interested in, in basically means life. Jivita actually means life. So you kind of lose your interest in life. <laughs> I 
it doesn't sound really good, does it? You lose your interest in life. It sounds like you're about to commit suicide or something. Yeah. <laughs> so, but that's not the point. Yeah. The point is that you, uh, uh, and if you don't, if you're not interested in life, of course, it means you don't want to be reborn either. Yeah. So you lose your sense of rebirth. Uh, and that is very, very profound, obviously, if you can get all the way to that. Yeah. So this is kind of the ultimate thing. And that's why now you can start to understand why the perception of death is so powerful uh, and how we could take the Buddha to be all the way to the end of the path. Yeah, Because you realize that uh, rebirth is just a horror. Because rebirth, what does it mean? Uh, it means re-death. And I always thought we should, sometimes in the suttas, I know that uh, Bhante Sujato, he translates jati. Jati is normally translated as birth, right? Uh, but he translated as rebirth. Uh, and the reason why he translates as rebirth is because in ancient India, Birth is always rebirth. So if you want to hear the suttas in the same way as the ancient Indians, they would have heard rebirth when they heard birth or jati, and so you render it as, as, a, as a rebirth. But um, marana, it comes after rebirth. Marana is death. So really what it means is re-death. Yeah. And that's kind of interesting because that means that you're, what you are really what you are afraid of is the perception of re-death. And that's why you are, that is why it is so concerning. Because it's not just one death, it is death after death after death. After death. After death, after death, after death. After death. And it goes on and on like that for a very, very long time. And that, that, that is when it starts to kind of uh, become clear why this is so pro problematic. So it's re-death. It's re-old age. Yeah, maybe you think old age in one life is enough, but no. How many times have you done this? Uh, it's re-illness, re-sickness. Uh, yeah, it's re-being separated from everything that you are is dear and beloved to you. Uh, it is a continuation of all those really fundamental problems of life again and again and again and again. How many times do we want to die here? You know, and because dying is usually very traumatic and very difficult. Uh, you build up all of these attachments during life. Uh, death comes and it, everything gets challenged. Uh, everything gets taken away from you. Every time it is traumatic. Every time it is difficult. Uh, so this is kind of when you start to see what is going on. So re-death here is not actually not a bad translation because that brings out what the real issue is. Uh, it is not only one time. It is actually going on like this. Uh, and so this is um, uh, what comes out of this. Uh, so... Um, this is why, again, uh, we try to do the contemplation of death. Uh, and what is so beautiful about it is that uh, if you feel it is difficult to do the perception of death and it kind of leaves you sad and miserable, and please, please don't do it because uh, then, of course, it's counterproductive. Uh, but if you find the death contemplation natural and easy, uh, then please do it. Uh, and even if you find it difficult, try just a little bit. Yeah, not too hard, just a little bit, just to get used to the idea. You're going to have to die anyway. Uh, yeah, and if you don't, if you reject that idea of death now, what is it going to be like when you ha actually have to do it? When you are there, it's going to be really hard. So the idea of getting used to this now actually is a very useful thing. So that when you come to that point in your life, okay, you can chillax. Yeah, you can relax on your deathbed. You can say, okay, I'm ready for this. See? Yeah, I can deal with it. And the strange thing is that uh, the experience of death for most people. Uh, we kind of think it's terrible, but if you are ready, it's a nice experience. It's nice because you're letting go, usually you come to the end of your life, your body is falling apart, Yeah, things are not holding together anymore. It's nice to get rid of all of this uh, dukkha at that particular point. And so you think, okay, I've had enough. You know, sometimes you meet people who are very old and they will tell you, I've had enough. I don't want to go on any longer. Yeah, you've seen that probably. Yeah, and they are ready to die. And then, so that means the reason they're ready to die is because the body has become too much dukkha, too much suffering here. And so how can we do this? And I want to talk a little bit more about this. We have talked about it a bit before, but because it is such an important perception and because the outcome of this perception is so useful in calming the mind and being an introduction to the breath meditation, all of these kind of things, it's worthwhile saying a little bit more about how to approach this. And there are suttas that talk about specifically about how to do the death contemplation. Here. And one of the... Mm, extra lunch. 
<laughs> I'm not supposed to eat after lunch, after midday, no. <laughs> 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 anyway, <laughs> that is one of those loopholes you see in, in the vineyard. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, um, one of the things the Buddha says in the suttas is a nice place where the Buddha asks all the monks are kind of coming around, or the Buddha is sitting there, and then the Buddha asks them, "How are, are you practicing the contemplation of death?" Yeah, or it's two words like it's marana sanya, also marana sati. Marana sati means like the recollection of death. Yeah? Are you practicing it? And then the kind of one monk says, yes, yes, Venerable Sir, I am practicing it. Well, how do you practice it? Well, I think, I think like this, uh, I might die tomorrow. And the Buddha says, that's no good. Yeah, that is really bad recollection of that. Yeah, that's not good enough. Yeah, sorry. And then uh, this um, other monk says, well, I think like this, you know, that I might die in kind of before, you know, before the nightfall, yeah, during this, this day. Yeah. And the Buddha is not impressed again. Though, yeah? <laughs> and then the next monk says, I think like this, I might die by the end of the meal. The Buddha says, no good. Yeah. <laughs> not good enough. Yeah. And then there's one monk who says, oh yeah, I think I might die. I think, like this, I might die after the next two or three spoonfuls of food. The Buddha, okay, this is getting close. Yeah? This is kind of getting kind of in the ballpark. Yeah? And then the last monk says, well, I think like this, I might die at the next breath. And Buddha says, okay, good on you. Yeah, you are on the right track. That is the way you should think. Yeah. And so the idea of the death contemplation is to be ready to die almost at any time. I've been ready to die on the next breath. That's pretty hard, difficult to do. Yeah, I don't know if you can even begin to imagine that. It's really hard to imagine. <laughs> it's hard. Yeah, but I mean, if you can do that, of course, you have absolutely no desire for anything in this world everything becomes irrelevant. Uh, but if you can just have the feeling of that you're going to die in a week or today, yeah, later today, bring it very close. Uh, no idea, you know, what the future brings in, in many ways. Uh, if you can bring it that close uh, and really feel that that possibility is not just a imagination, it's not just maybe it, it is the case, but no, one day it is going to be like that. One day it is going to be tomorrow. One day, it is going to be later on today. And because it's going to happen one day, now is the only time to be ready for that. So what does it feel like? Put yourself in that position. What does it feel like that you're going to be dead maybe in one day? This is kind of the idea here. So right now, if I, tomorrow, I will be dead, what does that mean? It means I shouldn't worry too much about Bodhinyana Monastery. <laughs> It means I shouldn't worry about very much at all, actually. I shouldn't probably worry, even worry about the, even the, the, even here tomorrow, I shouldn't worry about that either. Yeah, I don't, not, not that to worry about any of you guys. <laughs> not, much, not much left if you have to die tomorrow. Yeah, everything is kind of gone there. And so the idea is that that makes you very, it makes you let go of everything. Yeah. yeah? And that is actually a very beautiful position. You can see that, as I mentioned before. People on their deathbed who know what they're doing, they are really peaceful. Man. And the reason you become peaceful is precisely for this reason. There's nothing to be done anymore. Huh? There's no need to desire anything. Yeah? Yeah? If you know you're going to die tomorrow, you're not going to think about your next relationship or your next car. Huh? Yeah, huh? That's kind of completely out of control. Huh? And not out of control, it's not going to happen, basically. Huh? And that is really, huh? really, and also you're not going to get angry with anyone. Huh? Yeah. You're about to die. Huh? Why get angry with anyone? Huh? And so you tend to become very peaceful. Huh? And very often we don't take these opportunities. Huh? The opportunity is there because this contemplation, we know is going to happen anyway. So bring it into the present. Now is a chance to do this. Huh? One day it will be tomorrow. It could be. That could be today. Huh? Because it can be today. I have to be ready now. So what does it mean to die tomorrow? Huh? And let's feel that kind of in your bones. Yeah, this is kind of the idea here. Huh? And then this uh, process starts to happen. So this is the first thing. The second thing that the Buddha says, which is very useful, is to just to remind yourself of the various ways you can die. Yeah, Because sometimes if we don't really remind ourselves of that, it still, it, it still becomes like theoretical if you don't actually remind yourself of the reasons. And so just count some of the reasons that you can die. Yeah. So uh, the staircase here, yeah? 
Staircases are dangerous. People die in staircases. It's true, isn't it? Yeah, they fall down the staircase. My father had cancer, but he was getting very old also. And towards the end, because of the cancer and old age and everything, he actually fell down the staircase. That's how he actually died eventually. But, uh, you know, I mean, it was cancer. What was it? Was it the cancer or was it the stake? It's probably the combination of the two. Huh? Yeah, so these things are kind of scary. So don't take the lift, take the staircase. <laughs> yes, because that drives point, home the point. Yeah. And then you kind of feel and so make, yeah. So go walk the staircase. Do Marana Sati. Yeah. Or um, you walk, you know, as I said yesterday, you just walk into the traffic or maybe you choke on something. People sometimes die from choking or something. There's all kinds of ways that you can die. Illnesses, heart attacks, people die all the time. When you read the newspaper, look at the people dying, that could be you, etc., etc., etc. In this way, gradually, you kind of bring this idea, you make it real in a sense. And this is the point. Are you scared of dying? You, yeah? You, okay, you don't want to stay for the dying? Yeah. <laughs> okay, fair enough. <laughs> Stick yeah, she's going the staircase. Wow, okay. <laughs> she's testing this out. <laughs> okay. So uh, this is uh, the idea of the uh, death contemplation. Yeah, and it... Uh, what it does ultimately do, it reprioritizes your life. Instead of prioritizing in stupid ways, instead of prioritizing for the short term, instead of prioritizing things that are really empty and hollow in the end, at the end of the day, we prioritize things for the long term. We prioritize all those spiritual qualities. And it's very strange. Often you don't really have to think about it. Yeah, if you know that you're going to die tomorrow, this is really what you have to do. You have to kind of know that. If you know that, it's kind of automatic that you become a better person. You don't really have to try very hard. It just happens. Because in the face of death, that's kind of the obvious solution. It is obviously right. And don't wait too late. Don't wait till you are at death's door before you do these kind of things. There's a nice little sutta where there's two ancient Brahmins. Two old Brahmins, they are 120 years old, according to the sutta. I don't know if they really were that old, but they were kind of ballpark, very old. And they go to the Buddha and said, we are ancient. <laughs> we are really old. We are about, you know, we are in the last stage of life. We are about to die. Please, ah, welcome back. <laughs> <laughs> and they say, we are about to die. Yeah, please teach us the Dhamma so that it is for our welfare. For the long, in, you know, for the long term in the future, huh? and uh, the Buddha <laughs> says to them, and this is kind of almost a bit sad in a way. Huh? The Buddha says to them, "It's too late. Yeah, you are old already. You had the chance to live well, to do the right thing. You're asking me now. You're already about to die. Huh? Don't, you should have asked before. Yeah, you should have asked uh, five years ago or ten years ago. Not when you are on death's door. That's too late. Huh? So please don't do, make the same mistake. Yeah, don't wait till it's too late." Huh? The younger you are, the better. And this is why we should have more teenagers here. Yeah, there should be more teenagers here. There are exactly zero teenagers in this room. And um, because you want to, you, <laughs> you sh we should start young, right? And so, uh, so we have one teen teenager. Young, younger, not teenager. Okay, so but still, still, so that yeah, so that's true. That's good actually. So I'm really happy to see you here actually. Bobby's daughter is here, which is great. So that's really that's wonderful. So congratulations. So you are one of the youngest here, but even you are not teenagers. Still. You're already twenty in the twenties. Yeah, in the twenties. Okay. So um, start young because these are the realities of life, and the earlier you get these points, uh, the more ability you have to live right, do the right thing, and live in the proper way. Yeah. And uh, so, and people who are very smart, very wise, uh, they come to these teachings early because they understand the nature of life. Uh, yeah. So we have to kind of wisen up the young generations, uh, make them wiser. That's kind of really the, the critical thing. Okay. So uh, let's do a little bit of meditation.
All right. So any uh, questions or comments, please? Hmm. Uh, maybe from me or Chen. Yeah, um, please. I know a friend or another two, like two friends, or so one of them, uh, she had a um, death experience. So it was a boat accident on the, the, the sea when she was very young, and then she it, would, it capsized the yeah. families, and then she knocked her head on I think the, the boat or something, and then she said she she left her body, and she went up, she looked down mm. on on her own body in the water, and I think for her she described it as if time just 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 stood still, mm. and she was saying that she reviewed her uh, her life. Yeah. You know, one it's like an album to show her all the good things, and then the next album show her all the the bad things she has done, including the money she stole when she was younger or cheated in class or whatever. So, so it became like this, and then of course, uh, then she she went back into her body, and and uh, then that you know that's it. She was rescued. Mm. Uh, I think she was saying that uh, the uh, that experience was that she she told us later, and she says that. Uh, Death was not painful. Yeah. The knock on the head was painful. Yeah. But then after that, it wasn't painful. Mm. After that it was peaceful, she said. Yeah. Uh, the only thing is that now she says that uh, she became very daring with, with life after this. Yeah. Uh, not afraid to die. <laughs> right. Yeah. Taking a lot of risk. No, I'm not sure whether that, <laughs> that is a perception of death or actually you don't, death already happened. Then. You don't perceive it anymore. You know? So for us, it's, we are imagining an impending. <laughs> Death and we yeah. are trying to bring death closer. And some here is somebody who actually died and came back. And yeah. does it change their perception? Does it does it alter their oh, yeah. the yeah. way they look at life and things like that? And how is that different from or how how is that you know yeah. whether perception of death actually you know or is, how, how does it work in that sense? Is still very much it's, it's a perception, right? It's a perception whereas compared to someone who actually yeah. went through that experience. I think going. Going through it is uh, much more powerful uh, and uh, much easier because it actually you get everything in one go. I, you know, if you want to develop the perception of death, it is, takes a long time. It's very gradual. It comes over time, and uh, so it is more. Uh, but this, in this way, kind of bang, it kind of happens. Uh, and uh, they, I, I think that these kind of experiences are incredibly, incredibly useful. Uh, and I, I read a book a while ago called um, After. In this book, After, is about all the a variety of people who have near-death experiences. is one of the world's most famous near-death um, uh, researchers. It's a fellow called an American guy called Bruce Grace and at the University of Virginia. And this is becoming a legitimate research these days, this kind of research. It used to be considered like dodgy or paranormal and bad, but these days it's becoming legitimate. And uh, this book had this large number of uh, uh, cases and explained that similar to what you were saying, you could leave your body, you feel peaceful, right? And actually it's a Dying is nice, right? That's, that's kind of one of the kind of first lessons from this kind of experience. That dying is actually a beautiful experience. And uh, then you come out of your body, you are, and then you have, like you said, life review and all these kind of things. And then you go back again. If you don't go back again, well, that means you die. But if you come back again, you come back to life. And then the most interesting thing is what effect that has on the person afterwards. And one of the effects that you are saying is exactly the effect that you are saying. You become less afraid of everything in life. You, be, you start to live more fully, yeah? yeah, because you take, you're not, you don't, you don't, I think part of it is not really afraid of dying anymore, so you're willing to take more risks, etc. Uh, you don't, you know, and uh, there's a very famous case of a lady called Anita Mojani, who you can see on YouTube, uh, and she said that uh, she was Singaporean uh, of Indian descent, uh, and she said before her near the experience, she was afraid of everything, yeah, everything was kind of paralyzed, she couldn't do anything in life, everything was kind of frightening. And after it was going upside down, yeah. And she said it was such a beautiful freedom suddenly, instead of being afraid of everything, live your life for goodness sake. Don't hold back. Don't be, it's kind of crazy to go around being afraid of everything all the time. Uh, this is a very beautiful, so that's a beautiful consequence of that. Uh, um, and uh, also the other consequence that happened for most people after this sort of thing, uh, they became more spiritual. Uh, they started to change the way they life. Beforehand, they may have been very materialistic, uh, thinking about how to you know, get the nicest car, nicest house, how to kind of climb the corporate ladder, and all of these kind of things. Uh, and after this experience, they say, actually, these things didn't really matter so much anymore. Uh, 
what matters afterwards was to be kind, yeah, to actually, because you understood at that point what it is that you take with you when you die and what it is you can't take with you. And so they became kinder, they became more caring. Yeah. And sometimes the family members would get really upset because the family members was just as greedy as before. And they said, well, you're not working as hard. We don't want you to work hard. So we bring more money into the family. Yeah. But they kind of became more, oh, okay, I don't care about money so much anymore. <laughs> And so the family was really upset that they weren't as greedy as before. Huh? <laughs> That's kind of funny. <laughs> and uh, and so, so these are some of the things that happen. But so this is what happens when you have the near-death experience. But what is also interesting is that just by reading about those things, uh, it has an impact on you. Huh? That is what, one of the things that was kind of fascinating as well. So if you take a book like After, or you hear about your friend having this experience, uh, when you read about it, it affects you. Huh? And then later on, you know, you actually change your attitude simply by reading about it. Why? Well, because here are all these ordinary people. They are telling you that they had these experiences. You can't avoid but believing in it. Why would all of these ordinary people lie? It doesn't make any sense. Yeah. And so you start to think about life in that way. And you start to actually take on board some of the same lessons that they take on board. So I would argue, say that it's a good idea to read a book like that. So if you have a chance, read a book like After. Yeah, easy, to, easy book to read. The, the book has a very simple name, After, and the author is called Bruce Grayson, G-R-E-Y-S-O-N. That's the name of the person. And uh, easy to get hold of. Uh, and uh, so that is, uh, yeah, that is easy, kind of one of the ways of getting access to that. Or look at some of the YouTube videos like uh, Anita Mojani. She actually gave a TED Talk on her near-death experience, uh, which is kind of really, really nice. Uh, so, uh, yeah. So thanks for bringing that up, um, Yvonne. That's good. Uh, yeah. No, no, Jen. Uh, when the person is about to take his last breath, last thought is... Uh, very important. Um, um, so if a person who is sick and in pain, yeah. um, how does he reconcile the feeling of pain with the thought? Okay, so there's, here there's quite a few things. Um, and I don't really agree with the traditional view that the last thought moment is important. I don't think that. I think that is very, very overstated. Uh, um, and uh, this, so the first thing, Let's take the idea, first of all, of uh, uh, being very sick, yeah? having a lot of pain when you're dying. How do you deal with that? Uh, and I think the right, right approach is to take some medicines, take some painkillers. Uh, yeah? Often it is, sometimes it is, sometimes it seems to be that people think they should not take painkillers uh, because they want to be clear, clear and have mindfulness when they die. Uh, but uh, the reality is that um, uh, you will have that clarity anyway, because as the mind starts to leave the body, clarity will return. Uh, and this is what I was talking about before, about the idea of terminal lucidity. Uh, yeah, even though you're demented, uh, the last moments of your life, you, you regain clarity again. Uh, and this is a well-known thing in hospitals. Yeah? And so if you regain your clarity when you're demented, exactly the same thing happens when you are, if you are on some kind of drugs, morphine or whatever, to kill the pain, your clarity will return. Uh, so your mindfulness will be there anyway. Uh, in fact, I think your mindfulness may be improved uh, if you take drugs. Uh, because if you are, have too much pain, maybe you get upset about it or maybe you kind of get deluded because a lot of pain can be very difficult to bear. So I would absolutely recommend to take painkillers in the last stages of life and not to go through all of these pains. That's the first thing. The other thing is this kind of commonly common belief that um, uh, the last thought moment is important. And the reason why we have that belief is because uh, according to the traditional Theravada account, and this is the, from the Abhidharma account, uh, uh, you have uh, the last thought moment is called the Chuti Chitta in the, the Abhidharma. It means the passing away mental state. Uh, and then that is connects to what is known as the Patisandhi Vinyana, the consciousness, the reconnecting consciousness, uh, which takes you directly to the ne next life. In other words, the traditional Theravada idea is that there is no intermediate existence. There's nothing in between uh, but if you look at the suttas, the way the Buddha taught, that seems to be wrong, actually. It seems to be an intermediate existence. And when you look at some of the ancient debates that the Buddhists had, and these ancient debates are recorded in a book in the Abhidhamma called the Katabattus, that actually is a book that records these ancient debates. 
And in that book, the Theravadins are arguing with other schools. They're arguing with the Sarvas Theravadins. They're arguing with the Mahasangikas. They're arguing with the Swatrantikas. These are the ancient schools that existed over 2,000 years ago. And these debates are recorded. And of course, in these debates, the Theravadins always win because that's kind of the whole book. This is a Theravadin book, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, but, but it is there. So you can actually see what these various schools thought. And there were other schools that had different ideas. And some of them said there is an intermediate life. And so then I think, well, who is right? Just because I am Theravada, does that mean that Theravada is always right? Probably not, right? Sometimes we get it wrong. Everyone gets it wrong every now and again. So you read these uh, debates, and another school called the Sotrantikas, they said there is an intermediate life. And when I compare the suttas, uh, that is what the suttas say too. I'll give you an example of a sutta, how it works. One of the suttas, there is a, a famous, um, not famous, there's a fellow called Vachagotta. He was a wanderer in ancient India. And he went to the Buddha and he asked the Buddha, after you pass away, but before you are reborn, after you pass away, but before you are reborn, mm -hmm. what sustains consciousness at that time? Obviously, there must be something in between, right? Yeah. There's not just direct link. Yet. That, that's kind of bleeding obvious when you see that one. And the Buddha says, well, actually craving is just that which sustains the mind at that time too, huh? Just like a flame that is thrown by the wind, is sustained by the wind. That's kind of the simile there. And then once you see that, and then you start to see, actually, it is not just there. It is in a large, quite a large number of places. For example, the, the Buddha, the Sutta sometimes talk about this world, the next world, and what is in between. Ubayena antara. What does that mean? <laughs> yeah, and they are so. So I think that there is such a thing as the intermediate existence. And when you start to hear about the near death experience, that new one we're just talking about, that also seems to be the case, right? Mm -hmm. You go into this state where you have uh, a, a life review, and the life review is actually even mentioned in one of the suttas or, or something similar to a life review. And so that it fits also with experience as well. So I, I think that this is very, very likely to be the case. And because of that, the last thought moment is not so important, because what is important is what happens in that intermediate existence. So it is your life review that is a critical thing. And if you judge yourself as having been a good person in that life review, then that will make you feel good about yourself. You have a good rebirth as a consequence. If you judge yourself as having been a bad person, then of course you will judge yourself badly and it will take you to a bad existence. And so what that means, that judgment is based on your karma, on your actions. So what really matters is how you live your life, not your last thought moment.